The Business of Esports podcast is brought to you by G Fuel, the official energy drink of esports and the original energy formula of gaming. Visit them online at gfuel.com. Welcome to the Business of Esports podcast, where we explore the intersection of business and esports, the fastest growing entertainment phenomenon of this generation. Please welcome your hosts, Arda Okal, William Collis, and Paul Dawalibi. The Business of Esports podcast begins now. From the keyboard to the boardroom, this is the Business of Esports podcast. Detailed analysis, information, and opinion on the power, money, and decisions of gaming and esports. We thank you very much for joining us. My name is Ardo Ocal, a full house here in the Dawalibi apartment this episode, episode number 13, lucky 13. We got Paul Dawalibi. We got William Collis live and in color. How you doing, William? I'm just radiant to be with such amazing people here. If only, if only podcasts could capture my beaming smile. And we have a very <laughs> special guest analyst with us as well. We have the CEO of G Fuel Energy and Gamma Labs live and in color right here. We got Cliff Morgan. Cliff, thank you very much for sticking around after your interview to join us on the regular podcast. No problem. Thank you guys so much for having me. And uh, I must say, it is, is, is quite the setup here. I'm yeah. very impressed. <laughs> On a scale of 10 to 10, how great is this setup, right? <laughs> Give it like a 10 and a half. Yeah, yeah, probably, right? So for those curious, we did do an interview with Cliff uh, talking about his career, talking about G Fuel, Gamma Labs, et cetera. That is going to be a separate podcast. So you'll be able to download that on the same podcast feed, but this is going to be the regular business of esports podcast, and Cliff is going to jump in as an analyst, so he's going to help break down all the topics that we're going to talk about here like we normally do. Please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, wherever you find the podcast. If you leave a five-star rating and a favorable review, it helps others who enjoy business, who enjoy esports, or the intersection of both find it, that backstage algorithm that we're still trying to figure out. It helps enhance our visibility so thank you very much for doing that we got a lot to cover here of course for the last couple of weeks boys we've been talking about Fortnite and apex legends and william has been uh, nostradamus on the demise of, a- of apex yeah, I, I i i i'm gonna demand that we take down two podcasts ago because that's a digital tombstone for my esports predictiveness no i'm pretty sure you're still right E- Apex is not going to work. Don't worry. By March, no one's going to be talking about uh, it. Oh, oh, wow. Not sarcastic at all. Did we flip sides completely from the last <laughs> I conversation? I think he was being very sarcastic <laughs> on that. Let's talk about Fortnite's big announcement, though, in terms of the esports landscape. The Fortnite World Cup, we have details on that. This is directly from Epic Games. The road to the Fortnite World Cup begins with 10 weekly online open qualifiers running from April 13th to June 16th. Each week, $1 million will be on the line for eligible Fortnite players with payouts distributed broadly the top 100 solo players and the top 50 duos teams from around the world will then join epic games for the Fortnite world cup finals in new york city from july 26th to 28th with a 30 million dollar prize pool up for grabs each one of those players will be guaranteed at least fifty thousand dollars and the Fortnite world cup solo champion will walk away with three million dollars you can go to epic games uh full press release is there but like i said on the past podcast guys if there's the money if there's the eyeballs and if there's the product, the eSport will always work whether you like it or not. I mean, and this is proof of it, isn't it, Paul? I mean, we were talking about the benefits of Apex versus Fortnite, but come on, $30 million? It's been hilarious watching Twitter and Fortnite players when Apex came out was like, okay, now I'm an Apex player, right? Like, I love Apex, forget Fortnite. And then this announcement comes out and they're all like, oh, no, never mind. I'm a Fortnite player. <laughs> Can't wait to see you at the World Cup. Um, it's one of those things that, yeah, it's going to bring people back to Fortnite temporarily. It's a lot of money. Even making it gets you 50 grand, which is for a lot of people, a lot of money. The question is, does this save Fortnite esports? I don't know. I don't think so. I think it's one of these band-aids that will get attention. will get people playing Fortnite again, but money doesn't solve Fortnite esports problem. I don't think long-term it will solve all problems. I mean, they raised $1.2 billion, right? So, like, they, they have more than just the $100 million prizing to go to work to, to revitalize Fortnite. I, I agree with you. I think the prizing is a powerful pull, and that can certainly get pros in, and that might even draw eyeballs. But there are larger underlying questions about the competitive nature of the game and can it sustain a sporting scene. I mean, like, look, I, I can, you know, 
Checkers could announce having a $300 million prizing pool. I'm sure you'd see some interest. You might see some streams, but it's not going to change the fact that Checkers probably is not the best, you know, competitive game. And I, I do think there's that overhang on Fortnite. I will say I was at a Fortnite tournament over at um, Helix out in New Jersey, which is now actually the largest gaming center in North America, I think, by sort of active PCs. And I had an experience watching, you know, some of the best, you know, kind of players in the world gaming in there. And I... I was actually surprised, you know, in a sustained experience really viewing, there is a lot more, a lot more skill to Fortnite than I had given it initial credit for. Even, look, I've signed pro Fortnite players to a team. And even having that experience has, I see a lot more of the threads there that you need to develop it, but they're threads and they do need to be developed. But again, $1.1 billion left in the bank for Epic after this prizing. I think they can do a lot here. Cliff, what were your initial thoughts when you heard this? Um... I thought that the timing by Epic was genius. I thought that they couldn't have picked a better time. I don't know how premeditated or how lucky they <laughs> might have been, uh, but you know, the fastest way to keep everybody focused on Fortnite is to drop a $100 million bomb because now everybody has to practice, they gotta qualify, and it certainly keeps them in the limelight for a while. And I think that the people that are not competing at that level have the choice now whether or not. So I think that Forgetting about the top pros and the guys competing for the hundred million, it'll be interesting to see what the regular guy does in terms of where his preference becomes over the next four to eight weeks, and if Apex starts to lose a little of the shine and luster it got from the momentum, or it's too early to see if it has staying power. Like we know that Fortnite has staying power. You know, League of Legends is a great example of a game that's you know tr stayed true for years, but you know not every game can do it. So it'll be interesting to see how it kind of shakes out. Cliff, uh, I, as someone who uh, runs a brand like you do, the G Fuel, uh, when you hear announcements like this, like how much of an urgency is there? Or what is the thought process in terms of should we be aligned with this? Should we make an attempt? Like, take us through that. So I think that we have the benefit of not having to worry about what's in the limelight or what game is, is hot right now. I think that there's always a percentage of eyeballs that always go towards the new games. So, you know, when Spider-Man came out, there's a rush when, um, and Lyric is one of our streamers. He has a tendency to play a lot of new games, and that's probably why he has a large audience all the time, uh, because he's not, you know, the, the Fortnite guy, or the League of Legends guy. He plays new games. So there's an appetite for everything. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Just, of like, just like the idea of these esports terms, when you hear $100 million, oh. and then uh, you think, wow, yeah, maybe. As long as we're getting exposure. Okay. So for us, it's, you know, we want people that are, are getting eyeballs every day to be drinking our products, enjoying our products, talking about the products. But we have the benefit of not having to worry whether our team or our player comes in first or last or whether they're playing expired games because most of them will switch to whatever is fun. Do you try and capitalize on the, the hype around this kind of announcement, though? Like, would G Fuel ever say, hey, if... If you win this tournament, you get a lifetime supply of G Fuel or something like that, right? Like, is there is there is there a desire to try and capitalize on the hype around an announcement like this, or is it just, hey, this is going to be one of many over the next few yeah, years? Yeah, so I think we just want to stay current. Okay. I think that we always just want to stay current and whatever is hot. And you know, some streamers will always migrate to some things, and some will always just stay where where they're comfortable. But I think we're we're more interested in the eyeballs. And if it's trending, we want to be there. And if it's you know got longevity, we want to be there. And if it starts to fade away, we, we need to refocus. This is one thing I want to ask. Let's start with you, Cliff, on this one. So $100 million in competitive prize pool money for these esports tournaments, right, leading up to the Fortnite World Cup. But we've seen in the past that Fortnite has made major changes to the game prior to major Fortnite esports tournaments. December, the boombox being introduced hours before a major event being a, one of the uh, shining examples. So now when you see this much investment, do you think that there will be, whether it's a communication or whether it's a... A, a concerted plan to not do this do you think it will continue to happen because it's very different things casual games versus esports or will we see this cohesion now so i i think that if that's part of their plan they'll still update the game i know that we're only a few days away from having the next season of Fortnite start so i would whatever's current is going to be what they're competing against and i think that uh as a player it, it's it's sometimes aggravating when they put these new things like the redeploy and stuff like that but truthfully the guys that are really good at the game adapt quickly and that's kind of what keeps it entertaining. When the planes come in, when the, or when the, the redeploy comes in, you know, it changes part of the component of the game, but then those things will usually leave. So I'm, I'm uh, Or when the planes are vaulted, which I'm sure a lot of people are happy with. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I thought that even the redeploy thing, it became a game when that was, uh, you know, now you can get the parachutes to redeploy, but mm -hmm. when it was a thing, 
um, it totally changed the way you play your game, the, the strategy for how you played. Uh, and then when it was gone, it kind of reverted back. So I think you need to be a versatile, skilled player. Uh, and part of the Fortnite attraction is the fact that it's constantly changing and evolving, whereas other games are just always the same. I think Epic is scared. I know everyone says, hey, they raised $1.2 billion. You know, they're fine. Fortnite's fine. I think those guys are scared. I, of what? Of everything, right? You, because there's a knee-jerk reaction to everything so far, right? Apex launches. They start running ads against Apex on Google and things like that so that Apex, uh, Fortnite ads would show up if you do a search for Apex Legends. They make an announcement like this, and I don't think it's a coincidence in the timing. Um, there's talk now that they're going to bring uh, respawning a la Apex Legends into Fortnite. I think they're really quite scared. They don't want to go the way of PUBG. And so they're doing everything possible to make sure Fortnite does not fade into insignificance here. Yeah, that's kind of what I was going to ask about this is, look, they've, they have been the category killer. They've been the game that came in and because they, they know exactly how to steal a title. They've done it themselves. So I think there's probably an awareness in the organization that no matter the number of Twitch concurrence you have, no matter the cultural zeitgeist you've penetrated with the game, you can lose this. You know, this is a genre that's very in flux. And and I, the, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, the, no. the comparison to um, <clears throat> uh, PUBG was good because I think what it really shows us is PUBG's timing was off. Right? Fortnite came out. PUBG started dropping money on tournaments. They just started dropping it too late. You know, they, they lost a lot of their game players, a lot of their streamers, and then they started putting up money for tournaments, which meant... Guys like Dr. Disrespect that were big in that, they'd revert back to PUBG for the tournament. Yep. But the rest of the crowd, I think, had already mostly moved on. I think here, you had a big shift that was starting towards Apex. And maybe or maybe not, the announcement with all the cash kind of slows that down. And it could, if it slows it down long enough, it could kind of burst the Apex bubble. Or it could just buy Epic a little bit more time. <laughs> Do you think, but that's a question, that's an interesting point, right? Which is, is it just delaying the inevitable? Or is it really kind of closing the wound? That's the question, right? <laughs> so, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't well, think anyone's going to answer it yet. You know, Cliff, you deal with streamers a lot. A lot of the marketing for G Fuel comes through streamers and successful campaigns, right? And I'm wondering, when I see these kind of announcements, I wonder if we're just going to be seeing these top streamers trading back and forth as these announcements come out. Okay, Fortnite World Cup, millions of dollars. I'm going to stream Fortnite. Then Apex introduces esports. Uh, with a big announcement, I'm going to go back to Apex. And it's just going to be going back and forth because the skills are transferable enough and I can play both at the high level. And it's just going to be who can suit my needs the best at the at, at the moment. And that will almost convert indirectly to marketing dollars. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting is as much as we've talked about all these trendy games um, that are all similar with Battle Royale, in the last 10 minutes, nobody's mentioned Blackout. Right. Yeah. So look at that. That thing came in by storm. It's only less than six months ago. Rest and, in peace. Right. And now nobody's talking about it. So none of us really have the foresight, I think, to see what's coming down the pipe. We can just kind of maneuver today. And, you know, like I said, it, it's, it's beneficial to G Fuel that as a brand, I just want to be out in front of the audience mm -hmm. and I don't need to worry about picking. I just need to be in front of whatever's hot now or the, the top couple. Mm hmm. Did you see Apex's mark, like campaign? The way that they launched was very secretive, but they did have a lot of streamers involved. It basically was their entire advertising marketing efforts were bringing these top streamers in. Uh, from someone who deals with that world very uh, intimately, what did you think of that strategy? I think that the streamers like to feel that they're part of the evolution. So bringing them mm -hmm. in early, making them part of the master plan is effective. They don't want to feel like they're on the outside. Right. That's the part of the whole gaming community is kind of like everybody feels as big as the community keeps getting. It's still when you're in the middle of it, it seems fairly small. Mm -hmm. And Twitter kind of helps keep that as a universe that everybody can access real time. Um, so I thought it was clever, you know, and, and I think it was it was clearly effective. Right. Speaking of Twitter, you can follow us on Twitter at Biz Esports. Uh, feel free to yell at us there because a lot of people yell on Twitter, as we all know. Uh, if, uh, if we missed a topic or if you didn't like an opinion, uh, tag us on Twitter. We'll bring it up the next podcast. Where can we find you on Twitter, Cliff, by the way? Cliff Gamma CEO is my personal Twitter. 
So find him on Twitter as well. And uh, G Fuel Energy is um, all the regular G Fuel tags. So find it at G Fuel Energy. Let's segue to a streamer, Cliff, that you know very well. Dr. Disrespect has worked with, uh, is working with G Fuel. Uh, he was on ESPN recently, uh, highlighted uh, something, a fun interaction between him and Gordon Hayward. And I guess his wife is sort of the star of this clip. <laughs> Basically, Gordon Hayward was playing uh, on, on Dr. Disrespect's stream and asked, hey, can I play one more game? And his wife was <laughs> basically said, absolutely not. So Gordon was like, all right, well, I got to go. But the, 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 the fun thing is that this was picked up by ESPN and it was talked about. And then this just basically, once again, reaffirmed streaming and gaming back into these kind of platforms. So I'm, w what I want to ask about this, though, is that and, and we should also mention that Gordon Hayward is a big gamer and he's almost uh, gotten into investments, has almost bought a team. He's mentioned this uh, in interviews in the past. So he's very much in tune with the gaming community. But what I wonder is um, how much we've talked about this on the podcast in the past. I want to get your opinion. How much is sort of linear television or those established brands, ESPN, ABC, uh, Disney, etc. How much importance do you place on esports and gaming needing that sort of validation or being on those platforms in order to consider uh themselves a success uh i don't think it's i don't think it's relevant okay. so you know we look at you know rocket league and and street fighter have been on turner and that did zero for those franchises i don't mm -hmm. i don't see it where it's beneficial and to be honest with you you know so i look at a lot of these things in terms of real life experience and i my two younger boys are 21 and 23. And when my 23 year old who's now a senior at the university of michigan he was growing up he used to like in high school he'd have his laptop open and he'd have his tv on and he'd only have audio going from the laptop my 21 year old would have his laptop only he did not even turn his television on throughout four years of high school and he was the gamer in the family he grew up playing halo league of legends mm -hmm. world of warcraft and call of duty and he would never turn on espn to watch gaming ever so i don't while they might get exposure to people in the older demographic by putting it on TV for the first time, I've seen like Rocket League and other games on NBC now also, I don't necessarily know that that's really picking up their key viewers and the key audience for them. While I think that when you get a phenom like Ninja comes along and all of a sudden and Fortnite combined, and it's like the perfect storm where all these people went on Twitch for the first time, not with the delusions of wanting to be a streamer or a broadcaster, purely to spectate for entertainment. And at the end of the day, I think that this will mark a real big milestone in the, in the world of esports and, and spectating and entertainment because this brought a lot of firsts. A lot of people that mm. started watching video games that don't play video games uh, and, and the whole spectator side, uh, to the, it's the entertainment. And I think that's kind of the evolution that's going on now. And I don't necessarily know that ESPN or regular television broadcast is going to help that. I, I really hate the whole inferiority complex, like people who say that we need TV or mainstream media pretty broadly to validate what esports is doing. And, and the thing I hate most about mainstream media and the way they cover esports is it's never the interesting story. It's always like, look, Gordon Hayward's wife yelled at him for playing esports, or hey, uh, esports are a disease and you can get addicted to it, or uh, look how much this guy is making playing video games. Ha ha ha. You know, like it, it's always some terrible story. And, and, and yet, so many people inside the industry seem to crave the validation of mainstream media as if that's our, our signal or sign that we've made it. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you think that it helped Ninja to be on the cover of ESPN and to do Times Square in New York City and, you know, and the deal with Samsung? Does that, forget about the financial side, does that help his image in the esports realm, in the gaming realm, or does that hurt him? I think you might be surprised at my answer. I think it hurts him. I think it helped his pocketbook, like it helped his checkbook in the sense that he's cashing in on his fame and that's good for him. But I think, and, and his viewership numbers on his Twitch channel kind of confirm this. I think he's down quite low right now. I think he's only at 20 something thousand subs. Um, he's lost a lot of credibility as a gamer and a streamer. I, I agree with you 100%. And, and I don't think you but can get that increased, back. But he's increased, but he's gained credibility as an A-list yeah, actor. I, I, he yeah. can go to Hollywood now. Maybe. And I'm not saying that that was his dream. I'm sure that he wanted to be a, a streamer or play video games his entire life, right? But maybe that he saw that as the next logical progression. Yeah, I, I'm going to push back a little here, Paul. I think this is like 
a radio personality moving to TV and then complaining that their radio listeners are down, right? It's because they've entered a new medium. They're producing content somewhere else. They're drawing eyeballs somewhere else. But his core I audience think. is part of the authenticity in the space, and you're not sure how many of these moms are going to watch Ninja in a movie or on TV, yeah. right? When he mm-hmm. has, and I'm not saying they won't. And maybe, and maybe uh, you're right. Maybe this was a, t- a stepping stone for him. And esports and gaming was a stepping stone. He's a young guy, so what he does later in life, this might have been something he looks back on and says, "Oh, that's how I got to where I'm at." But today, the space is what got him where he's where he's at. Um, and there's no guarantee in the future, so it'll be interesting to see how it shakes out. I, I mean, think it takes away some of his credibility, or just I hate the word sellout. But and, and he, out of everybody in the kind of sold he des- out. He deserves to sell out. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But yes, it, it, but, selling out to Samsung makes him less credible and authentic in the space. And, and your analogy is a bad one, William. Okay. okay? Yeah. Because it's like a TV guy, because he was new medium, going and saying, now I'm going to go do radio. Okay. Right? Okay. Okay. Fair. No, but fair. that would have <laughs> been that would have been if TV had less money to be made than radio. Right. Radio is a smaller industry than television. Streaming is still in terms of dollars back and forth. Well, there's Look, not that many guys making a million bucks a month in rate in television now. So that, I think that's that true. He, that's true. He, he's really at the high end of the earnings spectrum, regardless of the pla- platform. But, but, but look here, guys. I mean, I and partly I'm playing devil's advocate a bit here. Obviously, mm-hmm. I do in some principle agree with you that, look, some of these activities look a little bit sellout. But <laughs> don't we have to try? Right. Like, isn't the goal to some extent isn't new media going to become standard tried traditional media over time and things like big brand sponsorships, Super Bowl commercials. Don't we have to try to start inserting the gaming culture there? And you can argue maybe Ninja could have done it in a better way, in a more calculated way, maybe with a better agent, although granted I think his agent's done a pretty killer job, right? Yeah, I'm, the not, execution I'm not judging might any be of that problem. Stuff. Like, yeah. Yeah. So I I mean again, there's nothing wrong with the stuff that he's done, but I do want look I heard on um, on last week's podcast, I know you guys referenced uh, Asia. I don't remember specifically yes. what part, but yeah. uh, I, I've been to Korea and I, I've seen kids playing League of Legends on the subway with a wireless laptop, you know? So they're, 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 their gaming stars are the same as our football and basketball stars here. They're just a little bit forward than us. So mm-hmm. it, it, maybe he's the first one. And, and if you wanna see the space progress, Maybe we needed a guy like Ninja to become like that guy that kind of traverses from esports into mainstream. But um, we needed the poster child. Yeah. And and he is acting as such in 2019 to the mainstream media. The mainstream media have, has essentially appointed Ninja to be the representative for the gaming community. And realistically, we could have done a lot worse than Ninja. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. I think he's doing a great job representing the gaming community. And I think, at least I'll speak for myself, in his shoes, I probably have made all the same moves, right? Like when people are throwing dollars at you. Look, you're not got gonna... the disrespect too is becoming like a real phenom and he's interesting because he's actually a character mm-hmm. right yeah so unlike all the other streamers and now he also so obviously he works with g fuel and he recently signed a bigger agency caa right, yep. who's represented jeter and lebron in the past so um ninja's probably just the first and in a couple of years from now maybe there's five or ten guys a year that kind of segue into mainstream and, and it'll become more more normal but but i do think and actually i kind of want to ask your opinion here i do think that's an interesting dichotomy is are we after celebrity or are we after character here because dr disrespect and ninja show two very different paths for producing a persona in esports and actually to me i'm not sure what realm or what path we're going to go down are we going to be seeing iconic carrot like is the future of gaming going to be made by iconic quote-unquote characters like han solo or is it going to be made by quote-unquote iconic celebrities like harrison ford right like what's the main face that's going to define gaming going forward so that's a good question i would say that dr disrespect is is in a good spot because he doesn't have any company he's not in a crowded spot Mm -hmm. and i also paul and i were talking before the show about uh, what might bring value to other Twitch channels in the future based on content. And Ninja's channel is Ninja, playing video games for 12 hours a day. And if you were going to acquire good talent and build up some kind of a streaming network, you'd probably want a little variety. And so you could have somebody like, you know, a Fox or Turner or any other network come in and start acquiring these guys and putting them on for X number of hours so many days a week. and Dr. Disrespect might be a more versatile kind of a character for something like that and ultimately could be worth more. Yeah, because I, I mean, my own personal opinion, I'm glad we kind of have an alignment there because I see this character driven approach as being the real next frontier in esports. And I think it's just like, look, when radio started, you had the news, right? Like, what do you do when you get going? You put who you are, you put 
common facts up. It's a next level to iterate into actual narrative and persona. And I feel like Dr. Disrespect's really in the vanguard there. And in my mind, I'm waiting for where's the 30 other Dr. Disrespects that are in the wings. And just like we talk about Mr. Bean, not Rowan Atkinson, or we talk about Ali G and not, I'm blank on the actor, Sasha Baron Cohen, right? You know why it's so hard, why you don't see 30 other Dr. Disrespects today is because to have a character and be authentic is not easy. To, to balance that is not simple. So I agree. Without, I think it's tough. Yeah. Though. I can tell you from uh, having worked at WWE for a few years, like those, a lot of those characters are extensions of themselves. It's the volume mm. turned up to 11, right? People remember Stone Cold Steve Austin, right? He was a larger than life character and ushered in a, a huge boon for WWE in the late 90s, right? But he was that guy. It was just the volume was turned up to 11. But that's, you would see flashes of that human being that character in him in real life if you had met him on the street but as a consequence do you think we will start like fast forward a few years streaming so big there's zillions and zillions of dollars being thrown at streamers and things like that do you think we will be able to manufacture streamers the same way we can put together a boy band I think today people will discover it right mm-hmm. i think people will di- once 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 the landscape becomes all the advertise I, and i actually get your thoughts on this too i mean i feel like advertising and marketing dollars will eventually move away from ads and pre-rolls into integrations with streamers because they have the built-in audiences tens of thousands of people are watching these people that's where people are going to want to uh, slug their wares for lack of a better term you know yeah. I, I feel like that's where we're going yeah, I, I, I agree. I just think that it takes a certain a character is not going to be born overnight. Right. So like that startup, I could imagine that even for some young people that have a character that they, you know, it's just the where you start to kind of build that up and the grind that's necessary to get. Um, and you have to also be comfortable with starting out as that character. Mm-hmm. Right. And so mm-hmm. then the rest of your time is anonymous. Most of the people that are streaming uh, at some point want to get recognized for their celebrity. So, you know, Doc, whose real name is Guy, is totally not the Doc in real life. So we, we've been to dinner, which is the first time when I, I met him when we went out for dinner. I wasn't really sure what to expect. Uh, but, you know, the mustache is real, but the wig comes off and he dresses like a normal dude. And uh, he's just not like that in real life. So it takes a certain amount of Does somebody. He, to... Cliff, it's not a mustache. It's not a mustache. It's Ethiopian yeah. caterpillar. <laughs> Be careful. Yeah, we don't. We don't. We don't want to get. We don't need. We don't need the ducks. We don't need the ducks. Does he get? Does he get recognized as guy on the street? Uh, well, we were at TwitchCon the first time we okay, went out so, for dinner, sure. so there were two or three people that came over and said hello, uh, and he was cool about it. Let people take his picture, even out of costume. Okay. But he was a really, really nice guy, uh, and not the doctor disrespect is, is a, not a nice guy, but he's very sarcastic, and he's just not like that in real life. Wow. I but, find that yeah. surprising because I, I would I would guess that th- that sarcasm has to come from within him somewhere. Yeah, because so. this is this is running counter to your st- going cold. Yeah, Steve exactly. Austin theory, I'm very right? I'm shocked. You yeah, know, it's a character. Film. Wow, it's totally a character. He's so a very fine. He's an character. actor. He's yeah. an actor. He's, yeah. he's done a very good job with this character. Yeah. So okay, so go, go uh, bring G Fuel into this for a second. Why why would Doctor Disrespect be the perfect partner? So um, how, how would you have identified Doctor Disrespect over other streamers? So with him, we we met him way before he was the doc, right? So before he became this iconic character on Twitch, uh, he was a smaller up and coming streamer and he was a G Fuel consumer. So Paul and I were discussing before the show, most of the influencers that we work with, um, they need to really enjoy the product, Mm. integrate it into their lifestyle. We don't chase the guy that just won the Super Bowl and ask him to hold the tub of G Fuel in his hand and smile (laughs) and take a picture and hand him a bag of money. It's just not the way we do business. Um, and recently, uh, you know, I, I, I can't not mention like the Roman Outwood and the PewDiePie deals that we recently signed, uh, but both of these guys came into our life in a similar way. Uh, Furious Pete did a collab with Roman Outwood, was at Roman's house, uh, and sent me a picture of Roman's cabinet. And he's like, look, this guy bought 16 tubs of G Fuel from you guys. <laughs> and PewDiePie very similarly sent me a message about a flavor that we launched. And then I looked and Googled his real name punched it into Shopify and saw that the guy had bought six or seven times from us previously. And then I reached out to him. So these relationships happened because they were already using our product, enjoying our product. And, you know, PewDiePie was drinking G Fuel on his YouTube videos way before we had a deal. And again, it's because we're endemic in the space. And I really feel like we belong there. We grew up in the space and, you know, other beverage companies can come in now and they could recruit these guys and pay them a lot of money. 
But in 2012 and 2013, when there was nobody else standing there offering them anything, we were the ones that were standing there saying, hey, we mm-hmm. believe, we believe in the space, mm-hmm. and we've integrated in the space, we've integrated with the celebrities and the talent, um, and that's the path that we're going to continue to take. So we're hoping that a lot of the smaller streamers that we hire today become the Dr. Disrespects and the Roman Atwoods of tomorrow. So we're going to ask you this question, spoiler alert, in the interview portion on the other podcast that you can also find uh, on this podcast stream. So you can listen to this episode, then listen to the exclusive interview with Cliff after this. But becoming endemic is very fascinating to me because esports, in my opinion, above many other forms of entertainment, is is particularly ruthless in terms of its uh, viewer base and its most ardent fan. So when you make the decision, we want to be endemic to this space, take us through how that process works, because there's a lot of people listening to this that want to get into this space, maybe spend some dollars in this space. So what is that journey like? Well, it's just, I, it, the integration needs to be authentic. I guess the easiest way for me to explain is to kind of back up and tell you how we, we got to the space we're in now. Um, we were paying a lot of athletes, UFC guys, bodybuilders, fitness people, uh, at the time, the heavyweight champ of the UFC uh, was the, one of our sponsored athletes, and our deal with him was 100 grand for the year. And you know, we had to beg him to wear the T-shirts when he was supposed to wear the shirts at pay-per-views. And I remember sitting in front of my laptop when the counter, when you still had a counter on your website, <coughs> seeing well while the pay-per-view event is on, how many people are going to hit the website, and we should make back a lot of our money in sales while the pay-per-view is going on. And it was very disappointing. I think we had like six sales and a couple Mm -hmm. of hundred people hit the website when they had two million people watch on pay-per-view. And then several months later, I had an opportunity when Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 was coming out. Um, I had a marketing guy that worked for me in California, and he said, my buddy has autonomy and runs these 11 game stops in L.A. And while you send all these girls with samples uh, to all these sporting expos and events to hand out product, why don't you send the girls to these events? It was before the digital download, right? So you had to go wait for the disc. So at 5, 6 p.m., everybody would show up online, and at midnight, the game would drop, and then they'd mostly go to like 7-Eleven and buy some kind of sugary energy drink, and they'd stay up all night and play video games. So we sent the girls there to hand out uh, G Fuel. Actually, originally, it was still called PTF, which was pre-training formula. This is before it was even called G Fuel. Much less cool of a name. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and this is, you know, we were a sports nutrition company, and um, we sold a lot of stuff to athletes and bodybuilders. So we send the girls was to... Was it be- a saturated market back then as well? The, for bodybuilding and, for and fitness, yes, yeah, very much yeah. so, okay. very much so. And uh, it, we were selling at GNC and vitamin shops. Mm-hmm. And it's a really rough terrain to navigate. Um, so I send these girls to 11 game stops, and I was in New York here, and they're in California, and it wasn't like it was a big event that was even on our calendar. And I wake up the next morning, and this is when we were hoping to have no zero days on the website. I was hoping for at least a one, two, or three sales every day, mm-hmm. and we were really close. We had a couple of months where we had 28 days of business and two days without any, so we start over again. So I wake up in the morning hoping to see like a three, uh, and instead I saw almost a 300. So initially I thought it was fraud, right? Because you just figure (laughs) one guy using the same credit card 297 times. Uh, But it turned out that it was really 300 different people with 300 real credit cards. And uh, it was a direct result of the girls handing out product, the people waiting online that drank it, playing all night, getting a really good experience and just going on Twitter and sharing the experience with the community. So we weren't paying them to promote. We didn't ask them to promote, but their word carried such a massive amount of clout at the time that that was good enough for people Mm -hmm. that didn't even know them to click on our website and buy the product because of that third party review. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm not really a slow learner and I couldn't really afford to be. So within like a week, we had fired almost all of the athletes and bodybuilders and fitness people and we hired our first 19 gamers and youtubers (laughs) who have many of them have gone on to be absolute superstars now um how would you have found them at the time so i latched onto one young gamer and he introduced me to 18 more and um we kind of i cultivated the relationship who who was that can you tell us uh, yeah, T squared. T squared was the first was, one. Uh, yeah, um, who now I think owns Straight Ripping. Tom, uh, I want to say Tom Turner, but I don't think it's, it's his last name. But um, so he actually was on 150 million cans of Dr Pepper. So oh he got the, Whoa. Yeah, so he got. <laughs> the, he was a Halo player. So he got the deal with us, and then introduced me to 18 more gamers. And then a week later, called me back and said, "Look, man." you got to run my contract through the shredder because it violates my agreement with Dr. Pepper. Uh, But he had uh, already introduced us to all these other guys, Gold Glove, Hector, Optic Hex, Mm -hmm. 
uh, Woody's gamer tag. Like he had given us like a lot of really big names that, and that's, and so T squared bailed. And recently we started doing business with them again last year, but, um, that's how we got. So that was like our first 18 guys. And from there we kind of built it. I also had to learn the space. You know, remember I didn't have any idea of the hierarchy in the space. Like the optic guys were clearly around for a long time and had some real swagger, but I didn't know the difference between who was who. Uh, so it took me a little while to kind of navigate, uh, okay. but in a short period of time, a hundred percent of our focus went to, I don't even want to say esports. It was, you know, influencers, gaming related influencers that some of them turned into vloggers, but all of them had a history in, in gaming. So we're going to do a lot more of a deep dive into your career and G Fuel and esports in our interview with you. Uh, that's a separate podcast that you can find uh, on our podcast page. So definitely, if you enjoyed this snippet of conversation here, it's almost like a teaser for that interview. But just going back to just the advice that you would give, I guess, like, make sure you know the space, uh, find the right people to partner with, uh, and then... It's well, just such an authentic rise. Mm -hmm. I think that's the that's, coolest that's part the of the story, is. right? Mm -hmm. And and to me, that that's the only thing I think that works in gaming. Mm -hmm. Like, if you try and force it, if you try and manufacture it, I, I guess with enough money, you could make it work temporarily, but... It goes back to, you know, the PCs. To me, it's the power of not just the influencers activating the consumers, but the influencers activating other influencers. That's what's always been so unique to me about gaming, right? It's not that when you get that one guy, they're a great marketing or spokesperson and they get you X sales or Y conversions. It's they get you 18 more people just like them. Because Do you remember when uh, YouTube had the featured video? Oh, window? yeah. Okay, so, I mean, how many content creators and YouTubers became famous because a different content creator that already had a huge following featured their video. Exactly. That's the way phase got built, right? I watched that happen all the time. Uh, and that was when we first started figuring out, Hey, like they, these guys need to put our video as their featured video. Yeah. And then YouTube took it away. Yeah. But I saw a lot of guys <laughs> become really famous because one guy posted mm -hmm. their video for a week and they picked up a few hundred thousand followers at the beginning of the career. Yeah, I mean, it's the same now with Twitch, right? Like host chains are Correct. basically the best way to get discovered. But that's something to me. And maybe this is my ignorance of other industries, but like, I don't think TV and movies work that way, right? They don't. I don't think it's some this incredible thing where gamers are so sensitive to performance and to, you know, authenticity in the space that they share what works amongst themselves um, in a way that activates a brand beyond just one individual point uh, or one individual licensing agreement or one individual promotional deal. I, I think it's it's also it's that, but it's also that in gaming, the percentage of people who are players and also creators is much higher mm. than in other mediums, right? Like the chance that you play, but also stream or also put videos up on YouTube, the, that percentage of people who do both is higher. So there's just more influencers as a percentage of the total gaming population. So, so now I'm kind of desperate to ask this question that's been running through my mind, which is, so take this discussion we've had about the authenticity, sort of the different nature of gaming. Take Coca-Cola and the Overwatch League, right? Huge sponsorship deal. Based on this entire conversation we've had, I'm curious, Paul, I'm curious, Cliff, what do you think? Is that a good move for the Coca-Cola brand? Does it make it look authentic to the space? Or is this an example of money propping up a positioning or a market entry that is going to look very transparent to gamers? <laughs> hey, Paul, neither Paul nor I want to answer the question look, first. I, I, I consider Coke, I hate the word, okay? I, I'll say it very flat out. I hate in the word endemic and non-endemic. I hate separating the two as if some brands belong in esports and some don't. I just hate that because I think all brands should be playing there or figuring out how they should play there. But Coke, I think most would agree, is a somewhat non-endemic brand. It's not, they're not selling gaming headsets, they're selling Coca-Cola. And, and the, the question is a subtle one in the sense that just asking, is this good for Coke, is not, is not enough to be able to answer that with a yes or a no. In the sense that it really depends how Coke plays it, right? Yeah. If it's just running a... 15 second ad in between matches of Overwatch League, then I think they've missed the boat entirely. Like they just, then they don't really understand the audience here or how to reach it. It's someone in marketing at Coca Cola that said, oh, hey, esports are hot. Like, let's do something. And this was the something they decided. See, I, I agree with that. I also think that they have a percentage of Coca Cola's revenues for their ad budget and their marketing budget. 
and they don't have to be responsible. They're not accountable. They don't have to have an ROI. There'd be no way Coke could even probably get an ROI on the type of spend. So it would be interesting would be to see, will they come back for year two? Mm-hmm. Right? That's how you know, did Coke yep. think it was worthwhile? Are they gonna, st- and what I see happen, and, and nothing to do with Overwatch or Coke, typically most of the non-endemics that come into advertising in esports don't stay for a second season. And you know, we, we had a big deal with Turner when they first launched E-League. Uh, we had naming rights on their studio. Geico, uh, Buffalo Wild Wings, Credit Karma. Uh, they were all the big sponsors. Year two, none, right? Because it didn't perform? I think it's a combination of you probably have the people of both. I'm guessing the people of Buffalo Wild Wings probably said, oh, esports is hot. We need to be advertising on esports. And we have a sports bar. Maybe the people will come in and watch esports on our bar. It, it, it's missing the mark between the drinking sports crowd and the uh, crowd that's watching esports. But I think they needed to spend some money there and they thought it was a hot space. And probably at the end of the year, nobody could really sit in a meeting and quantify what it did for their brand. So why come back? Is this why, you, Cliff, you, is it the crux of why you think you guys are winning? Is it just a knowledge gap in terms of how to address that market? Sometimes. Um, I, I know for sure that a year or so ago when we were competing for some space, we were competing against some of our competitors. And in some cases, we were bidding on spots that we did not want. We were bidding on them intentionally to draw everybody's attention onto there <laughs> and to bid them up, knowing that if they it. were spending a million and a half bucks on one sponsorship on a league over here, they're probably not going to spend another half a million in two other spots. And mm-hmm. so we were strategic the way we did that. Uh, I think now we're getting to the point where if, if one of the big beverage companies wants something bad enough, they'll just overpay for it. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know? Um, and that typically means that that's time for us to segue out to something more meaningful. So yep. mm-hmm. you know, every, every, we're not at that level yet. And I can't just write checks for the hope of, you know, who can write the bigger check. It's not a sword fight for me. Like, you know, yep. mm. I think I think Coca-Cola's involvement with Overwatch is a big deal. I think that that signaled perhaps the major brands making their way into esports or maybe even hiring more endemic minds to do this proper research to make winning scenarios for them. Do you sense that as well? Or, or do you still feel like there's a lot of uh, many years left for endemic brands to really capitalize? Somewhere in the middle. I don't know if it's many years, but I can tell you. Um, so I'll use a Coca-Cola analogy at the Olympics. Um, what were the Olympics uh, in Barcelona? Coke, Coke had a huge, you know, it was a Latin America. But by the way, this, of, this, they this Rio? shows how yeah, plugged yeah, yeah. we are into sorry. sports yeah. we are. Okay. None of us right. know what right. the Olympics I got, I got it, okay. William. Rio. It's Rio. Rio. It's Rio. So, so Coca-Cola spent Barcelona, Rio. a few billion dollars <laughs> setting up for a year in advance. They set up like a Coca-Cola city in Rio. And I know this because the guy from Coke and I were on the same panel together in the UK and I heard him talk about this whole story. So after the conference was over, I went over and I said to him, so I'm just curious, overall with all that money you spent in, in Brazil, were your Latin America sales the following year after the Olympics were over, up? And he said, no. So I said, is anybody at Coke accountable for that? And he said, no. <laughs> so, you know, I, to fathom being able to spend like a billion or $2 billion over a year to set up a city somewhere and not even have to worry about post, whether or not it was an effective spend, is not really a financially responsible way to even run a business. And I can't, you know, I guess when you're that big, if you have a percentage of sales that you're going to spend on something and you let those guys spend it, it's going to take a while before people that understand the correlation between the marketing that they spend in esports and what's actually going to work is, is going to be there. So I think a few more years. Or they're using a different metric, right? Like maybe Coke's not measuring sales, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's mind share or something more vague that you know, doesn't have a number attached to it that they can get away with. Sort I, of I guess, or maybe there's somebody there inventing terminology. <laughs> yeah, they get a, fired. A, a series of <laughs> multi-million dollar consulting deals justifying that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, you know, because I, I, I think on the one hand, when I look at the Coke deal, right, I think it is, I mean, nobody's disputing, it is a great moment for esports. And I think, again, and this goes back to why I said the Overwatch League is so well managed because they're just tying up all the things you would want to tie up to lay the bedrock groundwork for a true esports league, like a true permanent league that's going to be part of our landscape. So from Overwatch League perspective, gold star, right? From Coke's perspective, I can't help but sort of feel like this is such a predictable way of entering the space. This yeah. is the most obvious thing you could do, you yeah. know, to, to choose to get in here. And by the way, 
you know, that might not necessarily be a bad thing, but it, to me, it sort of seems it looks like marketing 101. Like if I had Google and five minutes, how would I take Coke into esports? This is how. <laughs> and I'm surprised you don't <laughs> see paired with the Overwatch League strategy a more nuanced testing strategy or grassroots strategy to infiltrate the brand in other ways, like a, a micro streamer, influencer style strategy or something. Just because I, it puzzles me so much that it's such a large, sophisticated company and they would only take one Halo bet this way. I, that doesn't surprise me at all. To me, it's like perfect yeah, big company I, thinking, right? Like, it's, like I, it's literally like th this is where you and I are different because I get the player thing, but, effort. But like, but like, I give a lot more credit to Coke. Like, they are full. They have great marketers. There's lots of smart people there. Now, it might. And by the way, you know, to our point we've been discussing, the budget is relatively a non-issue, right? Now, I understand starting with one marquee play. But I also don't understand why, because you see, I mean, I know Coke has been looking at esports for the last four or five years. I mean, they had an, I remember the very first E3 I went to, there was a Coke esports manager and they hadn't done really any Did they make a yet. city at the E3? Was there a yeah, they, city? They, 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 they did, but back then <laughs> E3 was in my basement, so. Okay. <laughs> I mean, look, William, I'm a startup guy, right? Like, yeah. I, my entire career has depended on companies like Coke being slow know, and not getting it. Mm -hmm. And like the, literally I've made a career off of big companies not getting it. Mm -hmm. And so they got it, but I think they got it at the bare minimum level, right? It really feels like this was just the bare minimum effort they could have made. And it was the most obvious answer to the esports question for them. And, and to Cliff's point, uh, my belief is they will not, these sponsors, will not come back year after year if the numbers are down, right? That, it's a that novelty. That could devastate Overwatch in the second year, right? So I don't know how long Coke's deal is, but if they walk as soon as their first segment is over, it would yeah. really be very negative for the league. I wouldn't be surprised, though, and I don't know the details of the, of the deal, but I wouldn't be surprised if Blizzard was smart enough to get these guys signed to multi-year deals. I, I think it's probably at least two years. I yeah. don't really know, but I would guess it's at least two because it looks it's a terrible black eye. That's it. Guys to walk away. And it probably took so long to negotiate a deal like that. I mean, there was no beverage category for quite some time. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so it's a, a really a newly announced deal, and we're about to come into what Overwatch season two. Yep. Yep. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. It'll be interesting. It is to a multi-year deal. It is a multi-year deal okay. according How to many? ESPN. Does it say um, many? it doesn't say in this article. I thought I heard three. Yeah, three is. I, I seem to remember hearing that too. But but it, that makes sense, yeah. right? Because the optics are bad, right? right if so someone walks, that also assumes that Overwatch League will still be here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Cliff, oh, I would I would high five wow, you if I could. Right I would here. I would high five you if I could. Wow. We were we were all waiting for that to drop. <laughs> Bring out my marshmallows. Bury it next to H one Z one. If I have to Cliff's watch take. another goats match, goats against goats, I'm gonna poke my eyes out. Hey, shout out I mean, to shout out to Monte Cristo for the goats pin though. I, I like that on the oh broadcast. My God. That was very nice. Oh, I think Susie Kim was the one that uh, found <laughs> that. But anyway, shout out to them. Uh, let's end on this. And by the way, if you want to continue the conversation, you can find us on Twitter at Biz Esports. Uh, since we have uh, a veritable uh, degree of C-suite with us in this room, let's talk about a change in the C-suite at Nintendo. Uh, so Reggie feels the stepping down uh, from Nintendo after several years as its president of Nintendo of America. And in comes, uh, this was definitely the most memed story of the gaming world <laughs> by far. Uh, great guy, though. I have met him several times. Uh, Doug Bowser will be the new president of Nintendo of America. Uh, so how this happened was Reggie released a, state, uh, a video saying he's stepping down to spend more time with his family and announced that Doug Bowser, someone he has mentored over the years, will become the new president. Uh, Phil Zemay has been with Nintendo since 2003, uh, becoming the president of Nintendo of America in May 2006. Doug Bowser will take over on April 15th. He joined Nintendo as the VP of Sales and Marketing in 2015, uh, basically taking on the same path that Reggie did uh, in his ascendance to the Nintendo throne in America. Uh, and pre previous to this, Bowser worked at uh, Electronic Arts. So he has a lot of experience in gaming, and now he will assume the reins as president of Nintendo of America. So uh, with all of you leading companies, having led companies, being in the executive suite, uh, this is an interesting situation because Reggie was beloved in the video game industry. Uh, Nintendo fans definitely loved Reggie. Uh, he was a very uh, affable character. People loved seeing him at events. Uh, and, and not that Doug doesn't have that uh, pedigree going into this role, but this certainly uh, can be seen at least as a big shoes to fill kind of situation that I'm sure that Doug will uh, rise to the occasion. But let's talk about that uh, as people who have seen this sort of thing before, even experienced it. Uh, just talk about this story and, and, and what you think will happen. Cliff, you want to start? Uh, sure. I mean, uh, I, I love Nintendo as a corporate brand. 
right? I just, I think that they've been great for the space. They're pioneers. I think they run everything really smart. Um, and so I would say that just from being a fan of the business uh, and not being on the inside of what's going on, this is probably a good next step for the business. So for on, on the outside, without knowing what's going on, I, w I would say, um, I, again, I'm, I'm a fan, and I don't think they're making a lot of mistakes. Do you think they're doing enough in esports specifically? They're a video game company, so they're they're not an esport company, and I, I I don't necessarily they're not always the same. Not every game becomes an esport, and I think that's part of the confusion in today's landscape. Is somebody comes out with a good game, then all of a sudden people want to figure out how to franchise it, and make it competitive. Mm -hmm. Not every game is going to be competitive. But it, it is a little bit shocking for me to say they're not really. Neat. And granted, I I know your point you're making about wider gaming, but they have arguably the most popular fighting game. If if fighting games are an esport, arguably Super Smash Brothers is the marquee. Title. We should right. mention that Frostbite happened this past weekend, and they peaked at what like seventy five thousand concurrent viewers for their Smash Ultimate tournament, which is very impressive. And by the way, the most consistent comment we get on the podcast is. I wish you guys would talk more about fighting games. <laughs> Interestingly enough. I love the Smash community. I love trash talking to begin with, right? So I think anytime <laughs> you get a bunch of guys playing and yelling and screaming and cursing at each other and having a good time, uh, I, I'm a fan. Um, but I don't think that that's, like esports isn't the crux of Nintendo. Yeah, I agree. Smash is probably like, you know, the, the end all be all for fighting games. And you could also make an argument like, look, Blizzard isn't an esports company, right? It's a gaming company. It just happens to have very successfully taken many of those properties into esports, like Hearthstone and Overwatch, right? Isn't, yeah, isn't, isn't well, 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 well. <laughs> isn't, isn't there an argument to be made that Nintendo could, yes, it's a great storied video game company, and I love Mario Odyssey to death, but aren't they, couldn't they be more? Right? Isn't there an argument that they're sort of they're leaving money on the table by not exploring this other side? Or of the maybe they're really in? just smarter. Maybe you know we they, we don't really know. But I, I don't think that there's anything wrong with them operating their company as a game company um, and not exploiting it. I think uh, you know I think Activision Blizzard is a little too fast to call games esports, mm. and maybe Nintendo is a little too slow to do it with. Smash. But there is a risk that that maybe they are just not seeing the future, right? Like. Maybe there is some future where no one cares about playing games that aren't competitive, right? That gaming requires that competitive aspect that no one will want to play a Zelda or a Mario I Odyssey. I don't or... buy that. Do you? Do you really think that that's what happened? Are you? Would you not play Tetris? Would you not play Zelda? Would you not play Mario Kart if they weren't competitive? If, you know, would you not well, play look, any took, of those games? Look, it took it took Tetris ninety nine to get Tetris sort of back yeah. people excited about. I know it. that's why that's why I made the I made the, <laughs> and, I made the and, reference. And and look, like I'll go back to Mario Odyssey. I mean, love Mario Odyssey, but why do I keep watching on Twitch? Because of speed running, which I think is yeah. But look, but I'm the what was the most popular game that was uh, purchased? Uh, purchased, I should say, not Fortnite, but like Red Dead Redemption Two, Move the Needle. Yeah, and it's not a competitive game; it's an open world game. Although a lot of people are waiting for Red Dead Two Online, right? Like that—that's kind of what people are excited about. Yeah, I, I think if you look excited about like, the game, but if you look at like, if you look at that studio's history, like Grand Theft Auto had legs because of the online multiplayer, more competitive component. Mm -hmm. I think it's like a natural stepping stone. The game has to be entertaining enough to bring in the audience for there to be a competitive scene, right? Yeah. So. First, you have to get people to play a lot, a lot of Red Dead, buy the game, play it, and then maybe a competitive scene will develop. Uh, I, I think that's very smart. It's user base, and then it can mature into something. But look, I, I kind of want to throw my thesis out on Reggie and Nintendo here, because I, I think the reason, I think, first of all, I think the argument should be made Nintendo is slow. Like, full stop, they're slow. They were slow to Twitch, right? They were slow to give streaming rights out. I think they're slow. It's a similar thing with esports. I think the reason why they're slow is because they live, they're a Japanese company still, and they live more in the mentality of the Japanese market where esports has not blossomed like it has here. In fact, esports lags horrendously in Japan. Yeah. Yeah. And that's my question about this change is I think one thing Reggie did a wonderful job of is carving out a personality for Nintendo that wasn't based in Tokyo. Or sorry, Kyoto, I think Kyoto's where they're based. Um, and I question is, can Bowser-san, our new no fearless <laughs> leader, continue to do the same thing? Because I think that's really important for keeping Nintendo relevant in both esports and as a top performing gaming company. Well, if you ask PewDiePie, this is the demise of Nintendo, right? He, he's handing the keys of the kingdom 
to the bad guy. You don't give it to Bowser. <laughs> I uh, hope you know what I hope happens. If only he'd been called Bowser. We feel a different, different last name. I hope that the first day he's in power, he has a fake press conference from Bowser's castle, <laughs> and he just embraces it all. Where he's like, all future Mario titles will be Super Bowser Brothers. Like we're flipping the antagonist and the protagonist. Like I just want to see that happen. I think it'd be hilarious. The, there was there was a, a really good meme. The other the other one I really liked was someone someone on Twitter wrote um, just. Hang on, wait for the announcement from Activision, their new CEO, Steve Lootbox. <laughs> Steve Lootbox. <laughs> so, okay, how about this, though? When you, uh, let, let's talk about the transition uh, uh, at leadership there. Just, like, just in general, when you have somebody that as, is as beloved as Reggie and you are now the successor and you have these shoes to fill, and yes, you do have a reputation coming in, but like, how do you handle that as an executive, and, and and what goes into the preparations? Do you do you make immediate changes to make your splash? Do you go status quo, not to ruffle any feathers? Like, what's the mindset there? I, I don't I don't think you you can make big changes day one. I think you and and the nice thing about the Bowser situation here is he's an insider, right? So he knows the business, he knows the people. He's not he's not some guy coming in from the outside imposing his will and making a lot of enemies day one and so i think those first 90 days are really about uh, easing into the role and wouldn't that lend itself to making big changes right away i think no. that's it's always dangerous to make big changes in those first 90 days yeah, when you it, take on a new role the other thing we have to remember is remember big companies have succession planning this isn't like yeah. All of a sudden, this guy is a decision maker. I mean, this has probably been prepped for two years with him gradually taking more responsibility, making more decisions. So I think the internal reality in Nintendo isn't going to be that different day to day. It's the external publicity of it. And that's why I just, I loved your suggestion, Arden. It brings me back to the Coke thing and be like, why couldn't Coke find that entry point? You know what I mean? I just, I think the the power of what what gamers respond to is the fun, is the authenticity. And I just, I, I, you know, I'll give it 50, 50. I think they're going to do something. I mean, Reggie Filzain became famous for his, my body, my body wants it meme with the, we fit my body board. is ready. Right, my body yeah. is ready. Yeah. I mean, you know, honestly, that was when he emerged in the gaming zeitgeist. You know, I think it is important for leaders of companies to be personalities and hopefully this guy will distinguish himself. It's, it's one of these things where, um, you know, does, does Bowser kill, uh, Xbox on the Switch, uh, you know, Microsoft service on the Switch. <laughs> Does he come in and say, this was all a mistake? You know, like, I don't think you're going to see any of that. It's no. going to be business as usual at Nintendo. He's not a turnaround guy. They didn't, like you said, they didn't bring in someone from the outside. Yeah. There's nothing majorly broken there. Yeah. We don't know all the little idiosyncrasies of their business, but they're not being restructured. They're not in trouble. They brought in a guy to be, I think, a smooth succession. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, least amount of waves as possible. And it seems very friendly between the two of them. These guys have worked together probably a long time. Like I, the, I, th what's interesting about Nintendo is, in spite of all the trends in the industry, they've succeeded even though they haven't necessarily capitalized on all of them, or maybe even any of them. Right? That they really haven't been kind of the, they're not the trendsetter, and they're not, and they're not jumping on the hottest thing at any moment. In they time. managed they, to be so successful, though. You know, it could be cultural. And the four of us might not just think that way and, and, and get it. But, um, you know, I think they might run their business where we think it might, some of the moves they make might be a little mysterious and mm. could have been done differently. Uh, but they are a Japanese company. And, they're, you know, they're, they're just not going to run it with the same mentality that I think a U.S. company would. I, and I think for better or for worse, they know who they are, right? Yeah, and yeah. they embrace that. Like, they're not trying to be something that they're not. They know what kind of games they make. They know kind of their audience, what they like, mm -hmm. and they try and give more of that. They, they're, they're not going and doing a Battle Royale game just because Battle Royale is hot. Meanwhile, Tetris, Tetris 99 available on the Nintendo <laughs> Switch Online. Yeah, that, 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 Nintendo that was, Switch Online membership. Let, let's end on this. Let's end on this. If you were in those shoes, what would be one thing that you would love to see from Nintendo? Say, say, say you had Doug Bowser's ear. What would be one thing that you'd love to see? It could be big or small. Here's mine. I would love to see the Nintendo World Championships come back. I know that they've been doing like a, every two-year cycle, 2015, 2017. I'd love to see it every year. I love that competition. I think it embodies everything that's cool about Nintendo. I love the vibe of it. It was in New York City in 2017. I was there, enjoyed every second of it. Doug was there as well, and he seemed to be uh, loving every second of it just with everybody else. So if it were me, I would love to see that yearly. What about you guys? Any a Anything at all? 
Bring back the Virtual Boy. The time is now for Virtual Boy to return. Sure it is. <laughs> sure it is. Completely red too, yeah. right? Like exactly. Sore on the eyes and everything. No, no I mean, problem. Very, very seriously, if there's one thing I would like to see from Nintendo, I would like, to, and this is it's trite, but I really mean it. I would like to see a focus on esports, at least a recognition that it matters, and a drive to produce some sort of content for it around Smash. Because I not only think they could have a big impact in the West, I think they could actually, they're the best position company to bring esports into Japan. And I think they could help Japan by pushing that. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Will about the uh, push with Smash. I think Smash is underexploited. I think the fan base is so wide uh, that they could be doing more with Smash. I don't could think they see, support. Could you see Smash as a as an esports title on the level of say an Overwatch? Or w- where would you at at its best? Where could you position? It? I don't know if, uh, and, and no disrespect to Smash players, but I'm not sure if the skill level to be a good Smash player is on par with a skill level to be a good mm-hmm. CSGO player or a good, good Fortnite player. Not any player, console game. No. Right? So um, I don't know if it would get the same respect in the world of an eSport. Mm. Well, but I would certainly be... There's so many people can play it and compete that it could still be a huge entertainment factor. I will say that I was watching Frostbite and thinking, how on earth are they pulling this off? So I can see the skill level. The counterpoint to that is I think Smash Brothers actually has the most stable pantheon of top performing players. I mean, Zero is the most winningest player in esports history. So I do think on that, I think it is true that Nintendo seems to consciously be making game design decisions to be making it less skill intensive, like the removal of wave dashing, right? But I also think somehow something about that core platform is working because, again, if you just look at consistency of champions, Smash may be the best esports title. I think the bigger, the, the other part that I would that I would want to see more of from Nintendo is just more support of the streamers and the content creators that is just not there in the same way. Like, it, it, you know, Will, you touched on it. It used to be very hard to stream Nintendo games. If, mm-hmm. if impossible, essentially. You needed to be approved and... You could only do certain things, and it was a it was a nightmare. Yeah, I, I had a whole streaming career as a gold cartridge Zelda runner, guys. You all missed it because I got <laughs> hit with a cease and desist. But, <laughs> but I think more support of the streaming because they're fun. They're fun games to play, and as a consequence, watching people playing having fun can be quite entertaining. Yeah, right. Like it, rather than someone playing PUBG and they're miserable half the time. <laughs> um, you know, Nintendo games tend to be uplifting and they quite fun. They inherently make you happy. That's Nintendo it. games inherently make That's you it. happy. And so it makes for good created. streaming entertainment content. Just like this podcast. And with that, I think that's our <laughs> perfect that's, note to, that's the perfect to wrap way on. to say thank you're welcome for making you happy listening to this podcast is the way that we should end it. Thank you for joining us here on the Business of Esports podcast. Find us online, uh, thebusinessofesports.com. Every single day you will find a multitude of links to get you caught up in the world of the business of esports. And many of those topics we will talk about on this podcast. Cliff. Thank you for joining us as an analyst here. Thank you so much. I think for you're going to be really you're going to have an open it. invite. You're going to have that chair's going to be open for you anytime you want to come. I love by. it. I love it, and I'm definitely coming back because I love the setup. <laughs> well, you're definitely coming back because we have an interview with you that you can also find <laughs> I'm, on I'm the uh, for that. Yeah. Also, exactly, you can also find that on the Business of Esports podcast page. So feel free uh, after you've listened to this, go and listen to that. Thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Business of Esports podcast. Check us out at thebusinessofesports.com and on Twitter at bizesports.